welcome to uh, Visions of Fourth Streeter. Uh, I'm Greg Haynes. This is my new show. Uh, I'm here with the city manager, David Plyman. And uh, I'm just filling in today for Out and About with Tony and Diane. They'll be back in a couple of months uh, to, to talk with you about Well, great. Today. I look forward to meeting yeah. with them. So anyway, I guess we should get started. So remind us of what your role is as the city manager. The city manager is responsible for overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the city. Uh, uh, I work with the, our team to uh, uh, fulfill the mission of the city, uh, provide all of the services that we offer, police, fire, public works. Okay. And you don't get involved with like local politics or anything? No, no. Uh, city managers uh, as a profession stay outside of the realm of politics. We take our marching orders from the uh, elected officials and so I serve the mayor and the city council here in Streeter and uh, they set the, uh, they approve uh, the budgets and personnel policies and give us the direction under which we uh, you know, actually provide the services. I think that's a good thing. Okay, um, three million dollars was awarded to the LaSalle County Housing Authority. How was that money going to be distributed? Was, was Street a benefit with, from any of that money? Well, uh, frankly, I'm not aware of that uh, because that's another unit of government. Okay. Uh, and they have been uh, communicated with us as to how they're planning on spending it. The city of Streeter itself was a was the recipient of a $500,000, $550,000 Community Development Block Grant, and uh, uh, that pro uh, that program will be uh, underway this year. It involves the renovation of 10 homes, where uh, homeowners will be able to, uh, through the grant program, get $50,000 each to uh, provide certain types of improvements to their properties. Uh, those homes have to be located in a particular area and uh, we're going to be holding meetings on that project. Okay. That was one of my other questions, okay. but uh, let me just add on to that. Uh, will this be an ongoing thing? Because we do have a lot of uh, houses that need help, a lot of people who are out below the poverty level in Schroeder. That's, that's right, and we'll do whatever we can as a city. Um, most of the funding, though, comes from the state and federal governments, and so we're uh, limited in our ability to work on these projects based on our uh, winning the grants. So, so we're, 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 we're applying for grants. Oh, sometimes you're gonna keep, we, it's gonna be something sometimes like we get them, sometimes we don't. And but will this be a continuing thing? To the extent we're able to land grants. Okay, all right, so we'll, we'll take that question out. <laughs> it was a little bit ahead of us. So. Okay, uh, so we wanna congratulate the new firefighter. So we're up to 14. So are we, we just need one more. Is that in the works to hire another uh, street or firefighter? Well, yeah. It's all based on our ability to fund the position over time. Uh, we do provide for 15, the way that the department is staffed, we, we're, we haven't reduced the number of personnel working on any given day. Firefighters work a three shift rotate or three day rotation, so they'll work one day, be off two, and uh, and so would require or would provide overtime opportunities for the other um, members of the department to fill that open slot. So to the extent we hire another firefighter, that actually reduces the compensation that we can provide for the remaining firefighters. Um, our intent is to fill the position, but we just need to be able to fund it over time, number one. And number two, uh, because of uh, financial s circumstances that have existed here for probably a decade or two, the city was not adequately funding the fire pension to the point where we got in the danger zone. And we're now getting out of the, that. Uh, we've improved our financial position with regards to the both the police and the fire 
Uh, we've been making full pension contributions over the past three years. And uh, so we're making headway, but it's we still have a ways to go. So at some point, you know, you stop digging the hole that you're in. Right. <laughs> you just reassess where you're at and then and then move forward. South Street is served by a volunteer department. Grand Ridge is, is a volunteer, although they do hire uh, through a contract uh, for one paramedic most of the time. Um, but a lot of the area around Street are, are served by volunteer departments. Well, I do got to say that people are very pleased with the uh, ambulance service that the fire department you know, uh, has. Well, yeah, the, 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 the EMS, the ambulance service, is, is part of the fire department, but firefighters are not actually working on the ambulances themselves. Uh, and that was done for two reasons primarily. One was uh, just the ability to start up the service by uh, the, t the date at which AMP was going to leave town, our prior company that was providing the service. We, we, we would not have had enough time to hire and train 15 plus employees in just a matter, in a matter of a few months. It was easier for us to contract with a national firm that has these uh, relationships, these people already working for them. But the residents do feel good about having the ambulance right. right so the, the, the paramedics time. are actually employees of a firm, but we're paying that cost on a monthly basis. Right. And it's all housed in the fire hall and uh, the and fire department actually oversees. Well, the fire chief oversees, not the, not the firefighters. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a good thing. Why do you think people love the fire department so much? I mean, it's well, they do. Good. We ask a lot of all of our employees, uh, whether you're a public works employee being called out at two in the morning on Christmas Day to uh, plow snow, so people you know can get around and. The streets can be kept open, you know, 24/7, or, or, uh, you know, getting the uh, emergency call out at the sewer plant. You know, I guess um, we should have asked the, the fire department. Or, when we or, <laughs> or even my management team being called out, or myself being called out. You know, I got a text last night about a, a fire, and so I'm communicating. We're on, we're on call 24/7. Police and fire are uh, at another level, I think, because uh, they put their you know physical well-being their own lives at, at risk you know when a police officer pulls over someone you don't always know who that individual is and what their intent is so there's a you know there's a I think we got like a lot of mental health problems going yeah well all communities do so you get, I guess but but people do feel good about the fire department you know um, well I'm glad to hear that uh, we have a wonderful wonderful group of uh, men you know and we have uh, women through the company working uh, as our medics and uh, they're a great group of people and uh, do great work okay so another question about the fire department though how significant is the two grants totaling over four hundred thousand dollars to the street and fire department for motor re for mobile radios and a new fighting how significant is that for the city in terms of like saving money like you know, you know, for the taxpayer. Well, it's a, it, the, the, the trend is for improved communications within the department as well as between fire departments on major events. And so the new radio system is a higher level of technology over the older system, which was, I don't want to get too technical, but it was an old analog VHF radio system now we're moving into a proprietary digital system that uh, is very robust but it's also very costly uh, both in terms of buying the equipment and then paying for it over time because we have to buy uh, airtime essentially the right to access this large uh, radio system that uh, Motorola provides and so having the grant that just means that Local taxpayers don't have to fund it, <laughs> and uh, okay. and so that's a good thing for Streeter, particularly you know we're not a wealthy community at all. Okay, so now moving on to uh, the nine hundred and fifty-four thousand grant for the Liz Marsor uh, 
could you explain what, what that's going to do and how is that going to help the city uh, sewer systems? Right. Lismar is a, uh, is a neighborhood, a street on the far east side of uh, Streeter that uh, the homes are, uh, do not have public sewer service currently. Uh, they're served by each, each lot, each house has its own septic system and in many cases these septic systems are failing and uh, they're not a able to treat the water in a, in a, in a safe way. So being able to offer city sewer service at a, for essentially no cost to the homeowners is a good, good thing for the homeowners. It's also a good thing for the environment and for the city as a whole. Um, we have been successful over the years in landing grants to underwrite the cost of our sewer system. We, have, we got another million dollars approximate to fund a major improvement this year at, at our sewer plant. So uh, having municipal ownership of our sewer allows us to apply for and get grants to fund things that uh, uh, otherwise would have to be paid for by local ratepayers. So um, <clears throat> it, are those towns, are those, uh, uh, is the Lismar, is that a part of the City of Streeter, or is it unincorporated? It, no, it's incorporated. It's part of the city. Oh. But we just did never get. Well, I think I, I can't. I, I don't know the history of that particular block. My guess is that sewers were not readily available to cost-effectively serve it when it was developed 20, 30 years, 30, 40 years ago, and so uh, it was more cost-effective to put in the. Uh, uh, septic systems, but uh, over time we got closer to it, and so now we're at a point where we can we can cost effectively serve it. I know. In the past, you were talking about some of the other areas that was unincorporated, right? And that's still every, contributing every, to pollution to to Streeter itself. Right. Every neighborhood has its own history. A lot of homes around Streeter uh, never connected to a sewer system. They drilled holes. Uh, developers drilled holes for each house into an abandoned coal mine and to this day there's a lot of homes around Streeter that do not have either septic systems or city sewer they are just draining their wastewater untreated uh, into the ground and some of that water then leaches out at some point into the river or some other little point untreated and so that presents a, an environmental issue. Um, we, the city over, over the years have complained to the state and federal governments about that. Uh, there needs to be money brought to the community to help clean up some of these neighborhoods. A major effort took place some years ago in South Streeter where uh, South Streeter uh, got off the coal mines and uh, built their own system. Is there any money, like with all of the infrastructure money from the federal government and money that the state is for infrastructure, is there any money, is that something that we're going to still be pushing for? The city, uh, the city has been applying for grants. Anytime we think we have a reasonable chance of landing a grant, we make an application. I know, but even though it's not in Streeter. Well, we uh, we were approached over by Kind School. There's a, a neighborhood on the uh, west, west side of Kind School about two, three years ago. Um, because their septics were failing and we designed the sewer system to serve that neighborhood, landed a grant to fund a good part of the cost um, where the pipe in the street would not be paid for by the city or by the homeowners. Uh, the homeowners were simply obligated to connect to the sewer at some point, but the neighborhood ultimately uh, rejected, uh, rejected the project. They didn't want to be part of the city they didn't want to incorporate okay well let's move on well that's a good thing though at least we're making some progress on uh, some of these areas but it's not a lot of areas up. is it around there you said it was somewhere. well uh, no well South Streeter is now served by their own system so that is a that's good, good thing because all ultimately that water is then collected and then it's uh, conveyed to our sewer plant so it's treated uh, but there are uh, 
I'd say that a good part of the area east of Otter Creek is unserved and as well as some areas in the northwest part of the streeter. All right, so the streeter incubator. Yes. Okay, they got a million dollars uh, to do a lot of improvements. Uh, can you give us a little bit of update on where we at with that? It's well, started. anytime you land a grant, there's a lot of paperwork yeah. involved. <laughs> and, and sometimes uh, local people can move faster than the federal government or state Definitely. government. It gets caught up in bureaucratic red tape or just waiting for the state to, or the, the federal department to act. And, and that's where we've been probably for this past six months to a year. But uh, uh, my understanding is things are proceeding and we're probably going to uh, get into the more formalized design of the improvements um, in the, over the next couple of months. Can't wait for that. <laughs> yeah, it's a big deal because the whole point of the project is to help uh, anyone in the area in the region to develop their own products and to provide a workspace for product development and small production so that uh, we can kind of build a manufacturing economy. Uh, that's our niche in the marketplace. The schools do a great job uh, like in the welding program and that so we're trying to find our niche in the global economy and try to promote economic development locally. Uh, so. Um a lot of talk about the 700 block of Bloomington. A lot of uh, like, what's going to go there? They tore down again a, uh, a, a car wash. So, uh, do you know what's going to go there? Or well, I've been told certain things, but okay. until they actually submit the paperwork, um, I I don't want to speculate on camera. Uh, it's it's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, in that particular project, uh, we we uh, we had a developer contact myself and uh, our city engineer looking for sites and uh, that property uh, was one of the sites that they were looking at and so we helped make the connection between the property owners and uh, and the developer and they made the deal and resulted in what you see today which is uh, the demol demolition of uh, the old car wash and an old house and uh, now it's ready for, uh, well, it just looked good future. just with those two things that yeah. demolished. <laughs> but yeah, we all, everybody's uh, excited about it. Anytime anything new is going up in the street, everybody's excited. And you know, the rumors fly, but you know, it's, yeah. it's okay. We'll find out eventually what's going on. Well, I suppose <laughs> most people could speculate yeah. their way to, uh, there aren't that many types of businesses looking to locate here. Okay. So, um, Will we get another chance to get an Arby's straight or hurt? Or is that, well, I, is that a done deal? I, I think we need to keep the council action in perspective. Um, and the council did not reject Arby's. They okay, rejected a fa facade grant. And that's okay. not the same. And it could very well be, even with the facade grant, that the project couldn't take, wouldn't take place. And the same token uh, could be without the grant, the project would take place. So, I mean, we need to, we re, we've rejected other facade grants. Right. And, uh, and so uh, that's, I, I, but it I, don't, I don't think the, the facade grant in and of itself is going to be the only factor in whether or not Arby's comes to town. Well, okay, this is something that like four or five people asked me to ask you about that. So if is it they just want that particular site or do they own it no, or the, do they go somewhere else the develop I mean, okay we you have a, a land developer someone who went in and speculated and bought the property mm -hmm. and has begun the process of demolition and then that landowner intends to sell it to or lease it to another company that would own and operate oh, a right. restaurant and you got different players the, uh, the land developer has already acquired the property and they did it even without any uh, guarantee of the facade grant. And so the property is likely to be redeveloped. Uh, this land developer has done other properties in town. Uh, I think they were involved in the Wendy's project and we didn't offer a facade grant back to there uh, because there wasn't a building there. 
and uh, and they've been involved in a couple of other projects. And and, and the, it's a developer that has well, deep about, experience in markets like Streeter. What about they were saying something about they was asking the thirty thousand to help clean up the site. Well, that's the facade grant. That's still a facade. Uh, it was always packaged. See, we offer um, on a corner building. Well, on a our facade grant program mainly designed for downtown, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, Fifteen thousand per per frontage on a corner lot. We've offered two fifteen thousand dollar grants. Um, so like Gatano's Vault, I believe right, yeah. uh, it's a corner property, and so they got two grants. And so in this case, the Gauchi Corner is located in a tax increment financing district, and it is a corner lot, and uh, would otherwise would be uh, eligible for the facade grant. In this case, um, the council decided not to award the grant. There's underlying financial issues. Our uh, TIF districts have actually been losing money. Uh, our debt service obligations are uh, exceed our ability to raise revenues, and so there just wasn't cash available at the time. And uh, and then there may be other factors that went into the the decision, but. Uh, um, they made application and didn't get it approved. We'll see. It'd be nice if we could have one downtown, just one big box store, one restaurant downtown. You know. Well, we haven't rejected or denied anything. Yeah. Someone has to make the investment. Yeah. Just saying. You know. um, but yeah, that, that's that's good. I'm glad to know that it's not off the table. Because some people like a lot of people go to Ottawa just to go to our well, and then they wind up. Right. Uh, when I say if it's off the table, we haven't been informed of that. Okay. New line from Peoria to Chicago. Real? Yeah. This guy, they're going to make stops in LaSalle. I think LaSalle and Peru, right? Or LaSalle, Peru. Uh, Utica, Ottawa, and Morris, but no stops for sure. I mean, there's a lot of infrastructure money there. I mean, I, could we, is, we already have a spur. You know, we always have a co connection on existing rails we could possibly use. Is that something that we could we could probably lobby for? Or well, I attended a meeting last week. Uh, this is a project that is being primarily sponsored by Peoria County and City of Peoria officials, oh. although they're reaching out to the the, the communities along the route that they've selected. To also support it, and uh, it's a Peoria to Chicago uh, project, and I believe there'll be stops in from Chicago. There'll be stops in Ch Joliet, Morris, Ottawa, LaSalle, or Utica, but not re on a regular basis. Just on a uh, there's a potential for a stop in Utica. I think to, for the Stark Rock market. Uh, LaSalle, Peru, and then directly from LaSalle, Peru down to Peoria. Um, Streeter has never been involved in any of that. Uh, I'm not aware of any, uh, in any the, of the planning efforts that Peoria went through to, to establish this route. We weren't invited to the table on that. Um, I think we're, we're monitoring the situation. Uh, the speakers at uh, last week's meeting at IVCC that was held, they had a public meeting on this, talked about the earliest that the route would start delivering service would be in about a decade. So this is not a project that, you know, we're going to see trains stop in Ottawa next year. And uh, so there'll be plenty of planning that goes into it and there may be an opportunity for us to uh, to weigh in but I find it difficult to imagine a route that would include Streeter and also include Morris oh. Ottawa LaSalle Peru uh, because you're going back and forth and still because they're they need to get the overall time from Chicago to Peoria down to about a two-hour period because they're competing with, you know, 
automobile tra traffic. So they want to they want to have a comparable time route. Well, so maybe I mean, there could be two routes. Maybe yeah, I don't well, know. I was just thinking like a spur, like a spur line. You know, it don't even have to really be a train. It could be like just a dedicated route. Well, to, you know, for a bus to just, you know. Well, that, that's something that... And the, so, the, the, uh, a lot of people were saying, because it's like, all of these places where it's going to stop at, they do have an interchange, street or dome. That there's plenty of regional transportation that could be made available to support the effort. I don't know what that would look like. Uh, we're still in the very initial stages of planning. And as I mentioned, we were, to the best of my knowledge, at least in the time period that I've been here at Streeter, we've never been asked our opinion about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there might have been a survey or something like that, but uh, yeah, it was a survey, and that's yeah. why we, when they then when they announced it, it, like a lot of people's like, you know, why we didn't get it. We well, get yeah, um, the, someone else selected a route, and uh, and it didn't include us. Okay, maybe next time. Okay. <laughs> It would have been nice. We, we, could, we could use the tourists here, you know. Yeah, never say never. Yeah. Well, it's 10 years, anything can happen. Right. All right. Um, okay, so the Majestic Theater, I know we talk about this, we've talked about this before. Uh, other people who have interviewed you talked about this before. Uh, the Majestic Theater, the Murray Building, I mean, they, they're right in the heart of downtown. Uh, you know, is it a way that it's, we could write a block grant to help those, or it's the block grant specifically for like public, uh, you know, infrastructure. Because it, it's a, it's a, the, the Majestic Theater is terrible. The Murray Building is not as bad, but it's just been sitting there. I mean, it could you know, those are two good places where you know a lot of activity could happen. Two huge buildings. Well, uh, to the extent that grant dollars would be, that we, we could bring, you know, land a grant to fund the redevelopment of the property, that would be a good thing. Uh, and uh, we'll have to look and I'm, I, I'm not aware of anything that a, applies. The city doesn't own either of those properties uh, and our tax increment financing district only has a couple of years left right. and because of agreements that the city reached with the school districts and the county with regards to TIF revenues you know we're we're sending back half of the increment to the other units of government so there isn't a lot of money that's available and it's already in the money that is available has already been spoken for so right. yeah, um, and that's been I, I think the challenge is that it's such an expensive project to undertake and the building is in such bad condition that uh, what, do you, what do you think the future I know it is going to be a lot of money because it was over eight million dollars just to renovate the, the uh, high school theater which wasn't even in that bad it was nowhere near close to the bad shape as the Majestic is in yeah and, and, and it begs the question that the high school has a need for an auditorium space, right, for their programming. Uh, what is the role of the Majestics? How is it going to, even if, let's say, we were able to land an $8 million or $10 million grant and the, pri the building would be completely refurbished, refurbished as what? And, and how can it support itself because the taxpayers are already tapped out. Right. And uh, you know, there's no two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year to put in to support a management team and workers and events, you know. So it would have to generate enough economic activity in its own right to support itself. Streeter already has a community theater. Uh, you know, there might have been a time when the tornado took out the old theater before they rebuilt that. Maybe they could have used some of those resources. Uh, the, you know, the, the downtown property was probably in better physical condition at that time. But decisions were made and, uh, and, and part of it was ownership and, you know, the uses of it and, and all that. It is a crying shame because it's part it of the, is. It, it, it's part of the city's history. Um, 
and it would be sad to see it demolished. I don't really know what the future is. Uh, we would have to win the lottery of grants, if you will. <laughs> the Powerball of grants to lay in enough money to make a meaningful improvement down there. And then we still have the issue of how we're going to support it over time. And is that the community's priority for the monies that we do are able to raise? Because we can't save every building. Yeah. You know, we, we have the challenge of the incubator, for example. and. Uh, you know, I spoke about the need to utilize that building to support economic development, but we we still have the open question, is is, is the incubator going to be self-supporting over time? Well, if they get up to some good manufacturing, maybe it will. Well, that's our hope, is that uh, we can kind of serve that niche and, uh, you know, there could be machine shops and that that could utilize some of the facilities and uh, you know, rent time. Okay. Are, is the city concerned about losing um, 160 jobs at once? And we're always that, we're always concerned about local employment. Um, in this case, it's it's sad to see the the the, the building itself. You know, um, it has such a deep, long history in Streeter, and to see that production line go away it, it is sad. It, it's, uh, we, we have tried to work with the company and reach out and figure out a strategy so that they would make the investments that they need to make in order to keep the facility viable. But, uh, you know, they made this announcement without really having any desire to work with us. So there may be other issues, other global factors or at least national factors that led to them make an investment elsewhere in the production of bottles for bourbon. But uh, we'll see. What good a place to put bottles of bourbon in Streeter? Yeah. <laughs> we drink our share, right? <laughs> yeah, we drink enough. <laughs> <laughs> so what about the other? Are we worried that it's the other half of the workers might lose their job? Is that is that a possibility that it might happen? Because some of the workers are really concerned. Well, um, I think everyone is concerned about it, and like I mentioned, uh, we're we've attempted to reach out to the to the company, and uh, frankly, I don't think we have a solid line of communication, and it's not because of the lack of effort on our part. So we just is it just is up in the air. It's private business. They're going to make their decisions, and okay. So, what happened to Flink? Flinks. Uh, I mean, well, I, is it out of business, or is it that's my understanding? Is they decided to? Uh, it's related to another company here in town, and uh, we have no inside information as to have they, have they moved yet, or is it still, you know, or is it? It just been taken over. I I, I really I have no inside information. I can't speak to that. Okay. It's not a a city operation. Um, final question. Okay. Sometimes the mayor is at the Street of Chamber of Commerce ribbon cutting. Sometimes uh, you are there. Sometimes both of you are there, and sometimes neither of you are there. Why is that? And um, you know, as people, some some businesses feel that they have, may have been slighted, you know, by you guys not being there, one one or neither one. Well, I mean, we're all busy people, yeah. and uh, um, you know, mayors often work. Mm -hmm. uh, they have jobs, family, you know, life. Uh, they're just busy people. Um, our mayor, as Jimmy did, uh, spends an incredible amount of time serving the community. Uh, so people shouldn't feel uh, that a, you know a city councilor not attending a ribbon cutting or a mayor not attending. They shouldn't read anything into no. that. We're all the, so uh, they they not they not being slighted. No, not at all. It's just they do what they can to serve. It's just one facet of their lives. 
Uh, and I'm speaking not just about our current mayor, but I've been in uh, serving cities since the 1980s, mid 1980s, and uh, so I've had the pl pleasure of working for uh, oh <laughs> a fair number of mayors and city councilors, and they're all good people, busy people, and uh, and sometimes I I get double booked. So if there, you know, if the chamber scheduled a ribbon cutting at the time you and I are meeting right now, mm -hmm. I can't be in two places at one time. And so we do our best. Um, people shouldn't read into it. Um, uh, yeah, okay. the mayor and I try to coordinate to the best we can, but sometimes we're just not available. Uh, the chamber does not ask when the mayor and I are available when they <laughs> schedule events. Right, the business is going to do schedule it according to their calendar, not according to ours, and so uh, it's a simple. I, I figured that, but we're, I just, we're just busy. I just it had come up like quite a bit, you know. What people have, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, it just seemed like maybe it's a we have said we can't make some things. We've had to cancel the fire department interview twice, you know. Um, yeah, and sometimes. Things just happen, you know. It's just we're just, you know, it's just busy, you know. You know um. So you guys, you heard it from the city manager. It's, <laughs> it's just a schedule. And I, you know, frankly, street is no different than most towns. Mm -hmm. You know, um, um, really, the ribbon cuttings are primarily a chamber event. Uh, uh, there's usually a group of chamber members that some chambers will have a committee. And that's what they do. Uh, I worked in one town where they uh, they wore colored. Uh, I think it was like a purple or red reddish jacket, and they all <laughs> would wear that. And that was they they were the chamber ambassadors, and they would attend. You know, and actually they paid extra to be part of the ribbon cutting events. Um, and whether or not the city was involved in it or not, it was really uh, mainly a chamber. Deal, but, we, but we try to be out there, all you know. And uh, I know it's one suburb I lived in. It was all if nobody could make it from. They always had like a representative from the city there. They always had somebody that represented the city at that chamber. Well, you know, we all wear a lot of different hats here. You know, our uh, know community development director is also our city engineer. Right. So he, and, you know, he's overseeing an awful lot, and so you know. So typically, in this, like the city you mentioned, it was probably the. That was a big. Uh, suburb, uh, big yeah, it was. Suburb. They have staff people, and if not, they probably have two assistants. Yeah. <laughs> uh, within the department, it's probably not the city manager. Um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but we try here, and in, 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 you know, it's reader. We we try to get out. So. Um, because you know, I mean, people are opening businesses up in our town, you know, and so we we should. Not just with the ribbon cut, you know, thing, but actual people need to support these businesses. You know, they need to come out and buy their products. And just at least take a look at what's going on. You know, we got to support our our town. You know, we got to support our businesses, our yeah, local business. I agree. You know, instead of driving up to wherever, you know, we got everything right here that you would need at a pretty good cost. You know? Yeah. So by the time you drive up there to save three dollars, you know you could have got it here. <laughs> Particularly with the price of gas right. the way it is. Yeah. <clears throat> so support well, your businesses, everybody. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, Streeter's remarkable that way. Uh, there's so much that's available here. Well, uh, I want to thank you uh, for letting us come by and uh, you know uh, talk about some of the things in the city. You well, I appreciate you coming in and giving me the opportunity to address the community uh, through our interviews. And uh, it, you know, I encourage anyone if they have any questions, give me a call here at City Hall. Um, and uh, the entire team here at the City Hall is here to serve the community, and you know, we try our level best. Uh, I'm hearing good things, but uh, there's all, oftentimes, you know, maybe mistakes that are are made or uh, Things that are, that are overlooked. Um, you know, there are times where I spoke to a resident last week about the condition of her alley, <laughs> and uh, you know, I I, I uh, 
been getting a lot of rain, uh, but uh, you know sometimes problems are very expensive to solve and we just don't have the resources. But we'll try our best and at least uh, at a minimum have, have the year and try to work our way through it. <laughs> Is there a black rat for alleys? What? Is there a black rat to get alleys? <laughs> well, I, you know, we, our, our focus is terrible. Our too. focus has really, have, if, you, if you look, um, uh, the city over the past decade has made uh, tremendous strides with street uh, and projects. And so our, the condition of our streets are, are getting much, much better. Uh, every year we're out there paving and that. We see them out there, but it's just like it's a lot. You but know. there's a lot more to be done, and we have neighborhoods that the streets were put in and they were never designed right to begin with. Um, uh, storm sewers aren't readily available, and they were never curbed and guttered. And some streets don't even have a crown, so the water can drain off the street into a roadside ditch. So, um, you know, we we have our challenges, but. Uh, we're working away at it. Uh, you know, uh, we need to do a better job with sidewalks, particularly on our main corridors. Um, but again, it's a it's a resource problem. If we had the money, we would obviously have done more to fix well, some of these problems. Well, when I first moved out here, the sidewalks on Bloomington and Park were like terrible. You know, like they had real high curves if you was in a wheelchair or just walking, and you know, if you had a hard time walking. Yeah. But that's been straightened out well, for we're, the most we're, part. We're so, putting I mean, it away, making... and we got a grant to fund uh, sidewalks uh, mm -hmm. over by Kind School oh, yeah, to get right. the kids off the street. And uh, and so we're, we're always trying to get money, to you know, bring money to Streeter. To, but... Uh, I just think we can't, you can't just do it all at once. No, we can't. We and, to prioritize. And, right. But, you know, people pay a lot in taxes and they expect a lot for that and uh, and they're entitled to it and uh, so we're here to serve and so if there are issues, let people, let us know and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to figure out a solution. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. All right. You take care. All right. Thank you for having me. Bye now.